Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the error, but seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, because you are our teacher. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're studying together in the book of Jude. I've spent some, uh, quite some time looking very hard at these passages that we're about to talk about. Uh, I just, I, I want to make sure, first of all, that uh, it wasn't talking about me. And, and it uh, appears that I'm in, uh, I'm in a safe zone. So we'll go ahead and proceed here. Uh, I believe we're at, uh, at about verse 5. Uh, uh, two videos so far in this series. This will be part three. Uh, just want to remind you uh, of, uh, don't want to do a complete review of what we've looked at it here in the past, but I do want to just remind you of a couple of things. Uh, bond servants, uh, Jude says that he's a bond servant uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, uh, we're bought with a price. We're not our own. We belong to Him. Judah understood, uh, I, I believe without a doubt, uh, but it, more importantly, the Holy Spirit is telling us that uh, just as Jude was a bondservant, uh, so are we. Now, uh, folks, I could take the time, and I debated whether or not I wanted to do this or not. I could take the time here to... Uh, to go back just to quickly review uh, what it is that we have looked at previously as well as what we're about to look at here and I, I could and I know this this might seem a little uh, off the beaten path here but I could go ahead and I could just somewhat give you somewhat of a uh, uh, I don't know, of a diatribe as to how a lot of Christians would read this. You know, Jude, the, the servant of Jesus Christ, the bond slave of Jesus Christ. Uh, of course, that's him. That's not us. Uh, to them that are sanctified, well, that's, that's if we're sanctified and uh, preserved in Jesus Christ. Well, of course, we're, we're preserved if we persevere. Or, you know, that, that only applies to us. There's, there's just a whole lot of ifs here is what I'm trying to say in Jesus Christ and called well maybe maybe I wasn't called and mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied well again that's conditional it's you know if, if I do if I dot all the I's and cross all the T's then God I have God's mercy and peace and and God loves me and that's kind of maybe how a lot of people will go into this with this sort of a sense of conditionality Folks, listen to me. This is a love letter to you by the Holy Spirit to the church, His people, Christ's people, for whom He died. We see grace right from the start. The comfort of grace is in the introduction to Jude 1. The letter, folks, and I, I hope I say this right, this letter is not addressing those that we're, about, we're soon to talk about here. Okay? Uh, in verse 5, 6, and 7. It was not written to them. The Holy Spirit is writing to His people regarding the, the people that we're about to talk about. He wasn't writing to them. He was writing to His people about these people. He has, in fact, uh, Scripture really doesn't have a whole lot to say to the non-believer except for judgment. And... Uh, I think you're gonna we're gonna you're gonna see a whole lot of interesting things as we go through this and and as I mentioned and I, I believe I mentioned in my last video I don't want to rush going through this you know there are uh, there are terrorists and there are errorists uh, it's it's kind of difficult to say that word errorist uh, that's not some term that I made up I heard that mentioned someone else mentioned that. You know, people who have butter in their mouths, but swords in their hearts. 
And there's no greater danger than that of a subtle enemy of which we are unaware. Kind of reminds me of the casualties that we hear on the news coming out of Afghanistan. But that danger is the lesser when the enemy is known. We read in Matthew 7:15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. There's not hardly a Christian on the planet that is not familiar with that verse. For such are false apostles, says Paul in Corinthians, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. In Ephesians, in our study in Ephesians, in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, and I remind you that we were we were said, it was said that we are to henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness wherein they lie in wait to deceive. I believe that these people, they, they're hard to discern at times because, and, and keep in mind that there, it doesn't mean the text is not saying here that when they came in unawares there weren't pe people in the assembly, God's people who did not know or recognize them for who they were. But what the text is suggesting, strongly suggesting, is that there can be those within the assembly that the, the very nature of the fact that they came in unawares demands, insists that we believe that there were those in the assembly who were, who were not identical to these individuals, these deceitful individuals, not identical to them in the sense of, of their identity that they were non-believers, but believers who were not believing that doctrinally they aligned themselves to these individuals in such a way as to where that they, to them, they came in unaware. These people, they, they hold back until they're pressed. You really push them into a corner, perhaps they're even quiet. They're not that outspoken. They mix truth with error, parallel logic, as I've talked about in in previous videos. They usually conceal their real opinions. They mix truth with error. There are those who hate grace. We know that just in our own daily experience. They hate grace. They, they thinking that grace is not enough. That we still must live according to the law. And by that, they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness which results in a gratification of their own flesh. We know that the strength of sin is the law, which amounts to a denial of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all grace. And that's what the text is saying, is that they have denied Him. The true design of the grace of God is that Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we may live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Our election and our calling being both of grace, we are bound to see that we receive it not in vain. I think we're looking at the only way that an unregenerate individual can carry the banner of God's grace. So, as I mentioned in the last video, I think we see both ends of the spectrum. We see licentiousness and legalism and just about everything in between. So, I believe that it was God who saved a people out of the land of Egypt. I want you to take note 
than in the text it says people, a mixed multitude. It was God who saved the people out of the land of Egypt. He, he tells us that He redeemed them. He saved them. The word is delivered, actually, in the text. He, he saved them out of bondage, delivered them out of bondage. And because they didn't believe, many of them were overthrown in the wilderness. The word in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is overthrown. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, one, one possible approach to that is, is that all of God's people who did not believe Him during their journey to the promised land were ruined. The word there means to overthrow. I see, I see two possibilities here. We see in other places where that word doesn't mean to go to hell, but it does mean to be ruined. One possibility is that there were a mixed multitude that came up out of the land of Egypt where those who did not believe Him were not His own. They were part of that mixed multitude, and it's those that He destroyed. The other possibility is that those whom He destroyed was both both some of the mixed multitude and some of his own. Okay? When the, when the Scriptures, folks, when, it, when, when God, the Holy Spirit, when He calls us believers, there is no right to assume that because you're a believer that you believe all the time. In fact, most of God's children whom He calls believers probably don't believe Him very much. They make some tacit admission, but to really trust Him, especially when everything goes wrong, that is a rare experience among Christians. So it doesn't necessarily mean when it says that they did not believe Him that these were not believers. And I've, I've in the past, I've talked about how that, you know, I've used the illustration of a thief. A thief is a, doesn't always steal. He's, he's still a thief whether he steals or not. doesn't mean he always steals. So, when it says they did not believe him, that, that these were not believers, you know, it doesn't mean that these were not believers. That It doesn't mean that they're going to hell. For what it's worth, it's my opinion that this is speaking of both some of the mixed multitude and some of his own. That's what we see in this, in this beginning part of this description that God's giving. Some of them were his children and some of them were not. And the angels which kept not their first estate. The word first there is a Greek word, uh, RK, beginning, origin, kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He's reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Uh, let me stop here and just say, just uh, for the record here, I want to say that as I was going through this, what I was looking at in these three examples that God is giving is I was looking for a common denominator. What did they all have in common? And perhaps that was wrong, and it occurred to me later as I was trying to, to find or look for that common denominator that maybe it's the point is that there is no common denominator. Or that there is, in a sense, a common denominator, but in another sense, these are three examples that explain uh, uh, that put forth three separate uh, uh, identities or characteristics. That that they're not. Uh, what I do know is that it all points back to those who came in unawares. That's what I do know.
It's my opinion that this verse is a, a part of the expression of Genesis chapter 6 that these angels did not keep their first estate. They left their own environment. Okay? Try to, try to keep that in the forefront of your thinking as we go through this. They didn't stay where they belonged. And they are now reserved in everlasting chains un, unto darkness. Unto, the word is actually into, ice in the Greek the judgment of the great day. The normal argument is that uh, the Jews thought that this applied to Genesis chapter 6 when it doesn't, perhaps. That's, I don't know, that's up to you. I, I think this is an account of them entering into a relationship that was not normal. Okay? And as a result of that, there were, there were giants in the earth for a period of time until they... Uh, I believe, died out in the flood. Now, you don't have to agree with me. I've studied it very carefully. I believe this is a reference to what took place in Genesis chapter 6. If that isn't the case, then these angels, whoever they were, and, and the normal position that uh, opposes this, being the experience as recorded in Genesis chapter 6, the normal position then is that they didn't like where they were. They wanted to go higher when they, when they left their own habitation, their own environment. They don't want to use that as their environment. What they want to do is use that as their position, and, and they want to go higher. They wanted to be equal with God, and because of that, they were sent to everlasting chains under darkness into the judgment of the great day. So those are the two possibilities. I think the text says that whoever this group of angels are, they can't inhabit swine and drive them down a, a hill into a lake. Now, my, my personal p position on this is that these are a different group of angels. About a third of angels followed Satan in his uprising. And as far as I can see, they're still with him. And they're still active. Whether it's some or all of the third is up to you, but, but God is telling us in this verse they left their first estate. We have three examples given here. We have the children of Israel. We have these angels. And we have cities. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah mentioned, as being mentioned uh, that with the emphasis on Sodom and Gomorrah, but, but not just Sodom and Gomorrah, but the cities... Uh, surrounding it. And if you ask the very simple question, why these three? The answer comes back almost immediately from the, the commentators that I've in, interrogated because, well, that's what Peter said. But I don't think I'm looking at what Peter said. I think I'm looking at what, at what the Holy Spirit said and I believe he had design in choosing these three illustrations, whether or not in one way or another you can, can try to link them with Peter, is incidental. To me, it's the same author, the same author that authored First and Second Peter, Peter authored Jude. And he chose these three illustrations because of these men who crept in unawares, and they were turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, our only Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have, these th we have three examples of that which is happening in the church. And those three examples are very interesting. The first one deals with those who don't believe. So some of these men that crept in unawares are God's children, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Where there were those who were redeemed out of the land of Egypt, delivered by God Almighty, who didn't believe Him. By nature, they were believers, some of them. They didn't believe Him at all. I've uh, I've got a friend who, who who's you know when in discussions concerning this subject, 
of Joshua and Caleb. You know, we know Moses appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. We know that, that he's in heaven. He wasn't allowed to enter into the promised land, the land of rest, because he refused to believe God, to trust God. Doesn't mean he went to hell. There are those, there are actually those, those, we, there are people, folks, who actually believe that no one went to heaven but Joshua and Caleb. And then there are those who believe that they all went to heaven because they were God's people. I'm, try, I'm trying to suggest to you here, that, and I'm not asking anybody to agree with me, I believe they were a mixed multitude. Just because, just because you were led out of Egypt doesn't mean that you were His. We're talking about a million people, if, if give or take. I don't know exactly how many. There was a lot. What interests me is that it was the land promised, the promised land of rest, okay? We rest in the finished work of Christ. We're, Hebrews tells us to labor, therefore, to enter into His rest. I believe that these examples are given because some of those who, who are teaching error and trying to lead others into error, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, into excess, are God's children. That's, that's, that's that way I have to look at this, folks. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Luke chapter 15. I mean, folks, can you imagine what he might have done in the far country? I don't know what he did, but apparently what he did wasn't very good. Obviously, it wasn't very good. I believe the, the, the Father is God Almighty in that allegory. I think it really happened. There was such a Father. There was such a Son because allegories are based on fact. There really was a bondwoman. There really was a free woman. So when you allegorize Scripture, you have to be careful that it's based on facts. That's why it's not called a parable. There was a father and a son. This my son was dead. And then I don't know what he did while he was dead. But he was always a son. He never ceased being a son. And then there are angels who didn't do what they ought to do. Now we come down to even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about them in like manner, it looks like that, you know, that phrase in like manner looks like the antecedent is, is the angels who left their first estate in like manner. These cities, these gave themselves over to fornication going after strange flesh because of the translator's perception that, it, that in like manner refers to the angels that left their first estate and committed fornication, they've therefore translated it strange flesh, uh, different flesh, different kind. And that's what they felt the angels did. However, it may be that the words in like manner refers to these ungodly men that crept in and as they go after strange flesh or different flesh, so did those of Sodom and Gomorrah. You're going to have to decide for yourself which that is. Those in Sodom and Gomorrah did the same thing that the angels did. They went after something that was not normal. They went after strange flesh. Point being, it's strange flesh there set forth as an example. What happens when you do those things? I mean, suppose you're one of God's children. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians 2, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we, we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh 
and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So here in Jude, they're set forth as, uh, as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. It, in my case and in your case, it fell on Christ. I look, I look at these verses in Ephesians, and here in Jude, and I look in, at my life, how that this is how I once was, and I see that these are the reasons God judges, but in my case, and in yours, I see that that judgment fell on Christ. What do, what do I deserve? I deserve hell. But my hell fell on Christ. That vengeance of eternal fire for us fell on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to appease the Father as it regards His wrath. But now the righteousness of God is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Under the law, the lamb had to die. The innocent had to die for the guilty. What did the lamb do? Nothing. But Jesus Christ was set forth as a propitiation. He was set forth a propitiation because of the looking over of the sins that are passed through the, the forbearance of God in order that He might be just. You didn't get away with anything. We didn't get away with anything, folks. Now, you didn't get away from the justice of God. You didn't get away with something for which payment hadn't been made. Christ paid it. The justice fell on Him so that you have peace with God. His wrath can't fall on you. What a sobering thought to think of those overthrown in the wilderness. Those angels who did not believe God and rest in what God had given them weren't satisfied with the provision and the position that He made for them. And those in those cities, those in Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around it who wanted to satisfy the lust of the flesh, this is what God has presented to us as examples concerning those who have crept in unawares. And I want you to take serious note of the fact that in the beginning we are being told to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We can be a believer and not be believing. And I want you to, if you can, if you can grab a highlighter and highlight it, highlight in, your, in, your, in this text. Take note of the fact and highlight the fact that everything that you see that following, well, I hope I can say this right. What you see, what you will see in the text, folks, here is you will see that because they didn't believe God, now you see the results of that unbelief. Uh, I'm probably going to have to do a better job of explaining this. Um, we are God's people. He led us out of bondage, okay? Bondage to sin, self, the law. And in our journey through our wilderness, He continues to guide our path, providing and caring for our every need. And all He asks is that we believe. That's it. Just trust in Him. It's the greatest thing that we can possibly do is trust in Him. It's what I've said He desires most. I believe that for a fact. Because not to do so leads only to ruin. However, our trusting in Him carries us into that place of spiritual rest. Are you, are you following? Hebrews 4, Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left 
us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to fall short, come short of it. Let me let me look. Just turn to this. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest as he did, as, or as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. But like the angels who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, these are those among us who have, have gone against their position and their purpose, the ones who crept in unawares, same as the, as the angels. They've gone against their position and their purpose, who despise God's established order and authority, who don't belong to Him, who, who appeared uh, to be of us, but who have, like Sodom and Gomorrah, gone after strange flesh. Strange flesh. And I, I pointed out that, that that can... that's We understand both... I think both of us can agree that we understand perfectly what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah physically. But God is using this illustration to explain, I believe, a, a deeper... Uh, it's not that there's... It doesn't include physical fornication or adultery but there's spiritual adultery as well it's being married to christ and having an endless flirtatious affair with the law and, and as i said there's 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 two ends there's there's both ends of the, the spectrum you've got legalism on the one hand you've got licentiousness on the other so we see those overthrown in the wilderness, those who did not believe God and rest in what God had given them, who were not satisfied with His provision and the position that God made for them, who wanted to satisfy the lusts of the flesh that in, the spirit, in the spiritual sense. Folks, that's, that's law, spiritual adultery. And I see these are the reasons God judges, but in my case, that fell on Christ. I believe that God is asking us, or who, right here in this text, I believe God is 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 trying to show us that those who are in Christ, we are to live as who we are, not as who we once were, not our former state, our former position, not to. Not to leave our present position, our, our current position, to, uh, because we're dissatisfied with it, to, to go back to living as, as we were. But I, I believe it's more than just a Christian under grace going back and, and living back under law. We have a mixed, we have wheat and tare growing together. Like the Israelites. He would have us dwell where we belong in that in that place of, of of trusting Him through our wilderness, which results in rest, resting in what He's done for us, and not be overthrown. We rest in our position in Him. He gives us an example of those angels who did didn't want to remain or abide in that position in which God had placed them. We see in the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in the, the cities around it, how they turned those places that God had provided for them to reside into places to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. In, in all three examples, we hear the same thought, I believe, in our Lord's own words when He told His disciples in the 15th chapter of John, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, this is what we saw in the first two verses of Jude here. We're clean. 
or at least we see our position. We see how God is, is seeing us, is relating to us. And our Lord says, Abide in me and I in you as the branch can't bear fruit of, except, of itself. Except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. That's not going to hell. That has to do with fruit. What God produces in and through your life, through the method, the system, the authority in which the, of which He's designed. He can't come through the flesh. He goes on to say, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Folks, all I see here in these passages is the grace and the comfort of our God. As it, it's, it's God's calling. God using Jude. God the Holy Spirit working through our brother Jude. to describe a situation in the church at his time, which I believe we're looking at something that's timeless here. It, this didn't stop. In which we have, we have those within the assembly that we can not be aware of because we are basically aligning ourselves doctrinally with them. But there are those who are a little, little smarter than that. There are those in the assembly who, even though they've came in unawares, there are those who have marked them out. They've carefully, they've, they've, they've got their eye on them. They know what they're doing. And what they're doing is they're turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. How many times have you heard someone you know, say, to you if, if you though for those of you who really push grace how many times have you heard someone say you know uh, almost and i've folks i've even had them really want they want to hurt me okay at times in arguing against the fact that, that grace is sufficient that grace is enough it, it, it's they because they, they, what they believe is they believe that we are the ones that are push, pushing this idea with, oh, okay, well, if we're under grace and we're not under law, then we can just go live any way we want. And that, they find that offensive. They believe they're doing God a service by telling us that, look, grace is not enough. It's not about just what Christ did. I understand what He did was wonderful. I understand it was great. What Christ did was great. But, but man, that's, just, that's not enough. You can't just say that that's all that there is. Folks, I've been saying for 33 years that's all there is. The only reason that you do anything that you do is because God has done. Everything springs forth from belief, okay? Faith exercised equals the righteousness of God. If there's an absence of faith, if there's an absence of belief, anytime you're not believing and trusting God, you're sinning, okay? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Crept in unawares. It gives us a picture of not one, but two categories of people. It is a double-sided coin, folks, because the only way people in the assembly could not know that these ones who, who crept in unawares were there is because they identified with them. They did not earnestly contend for the faith once delivered. They believed not. And as a result of that unbelief, this is what I wanted you to highlight. As a result of that unbelief, every action verb listed in this passage
followed as a result of that absence of faith. Take note of the verbs. As a result of, of them believing not, you've got what follows, kept not, left, giving themselves over, going after. Those are the results. The results of not believing God. When we live outside that sphere of, of who we are, when we abandon the, uh, the place in which we truly do reside as believers, when we try to live outside that realm, it only results in spiritual ruin. But we're kept, we're preserved. We saw that in the, at the very beginning of this study. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.